Well, hello, good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. And welcome to our special online discussion, which is titled 30 Years On, The Legacy of the Post-Soviet Transformation and the Future of Democracy, Perspectives on Transition from the Wider Europe. Uh, this, this discussion is one of the several that have been organized over the past few days as part of the concluding conference of the project titled Rethinking the Democratic Future, Lessons from the 20th Century, a project which was led by the Open Lithuania Foundation in partnership with New Eastern Europe, the Jan Novak Jezerinsky College of Eastern Europe, uh, Visegrad Insight, and the Respublika Foundation. And the project and this event uh, are supported by the Europe for Citizens funding of the European Commission. My name is Adam Reichert. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of New Eastern Europe, and I have the pleasure to host today's discussion. Uh, and I've also been involved in the project Rethinking Democratic Futures pro uh, since we launched, I think, over two years ago in November 2019. And throughout the course of the project, we have been examining and critically assessing the last 30 plus years of the transformation in the region of Central and Eastern Europe. We've organized debates, uh, we've interviewed key actors and civil society representatives from the transformation period. We've asked for input from the next generation about their thoughts on the future, uh, as was also discussed yesterday in one of the panels. We also organized a special autumn school last October in Poland, which brought 12 young scholars and researchers in person to debate the topic of history and memory in the region following the transformation. I hope some of them are joining us and watching today. And uh, while our starting point for this project was the year 1989, I really wanted to have our final conversation, which is today, about the transformation which began in 1991. And this is the transformation in the post-Soviet space. Because truly these two events and these two years are, are intertwined and they're interconnected. Yet the paths that were taken when we compare states like Poland, Czech Republic, or the Baltic states to countries like Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, we see a stark contrast, which means there's still a lot of reflection to be done on those events uh, and, and also looking towards the future. And so our panel today, uh, and I'm really excited about, uh, about this discussion, uh, we're going to critically assess the changes that have taken place in Europe since the fall of the Soviet Union. And we're gonna look at the developments in the countries since independence, we're gonna discuss what lies ahead for uh, for the next generation, especially when we look at this topic of democratic developments. So uh, we will feature an overview discussion of the transformation, and then we'll look at specific case uh, studies of Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. But before we begin, let me briefly introduce our panelists, and then I will hand it over to our first speaker. Uh, we are very lucky to have such a, a, an array of speakers today, and we are located all over all over the globe. Um, our first, uh, the first person I would like to introduce is, is, is Kate Graney. She's a professor and the Joseph C. Palamountin Chair of Political Science at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. She's a researcher specializing in the region and author of the book titled Russia, the Former Soviet Republics and Europe Since 1989, Transformation and Tragedy. We have with us also Olga Onuk, a senior lecturer in politics and associate professor, professor at the University of Manchester. She is also an associate of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. And this year is a visiting senior research associate at the Center for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at the University of Toronto, widely published academically and also a well-known researcher and commentator on Ukrainian issues. We have up from Georgia in, in Tbilisi, Bakar Berakashvili, who is a professor of political science and sociology at the Georgian American University. And he is a regular commentator uh, and writer on Georgian politics in Georgian and international media. And last but not least, of course, is Denis Chenusa, who is a political scientist and researcher at the University of Gießen in Germany. Denis is one of, uh, one of the most recognized researchers uh, on Moldova and Moldovan affairs, publishing with many international media outlets uh, including New Eastern Europe. And in fact, I think uh, maybe with the exception of Professor Graney, uh, all of our speakers have at one point uh, been uh, contributors to New Eastern, New Eastern Europe. So it's really great to have, uh, to have all of you here. So once again, thank you uh, to our speakers for joining us. Thank you for, for all of you who are out there. 
Uh, and lastly, before we begin, if you do have questions or comments, there's a little chat box on the right side of your screen. Um, and we will have uh, some time at the end for specific questions. So do please feel free uh, to, to add your questions there. Uh, we will be monitoring them. Uh, I know we have a lot of students out there watching, so I'm definitely looking forward to, to your interesting questions and comments. Uh, okay, so let's get into our discussion. Uh, we're gonna start now with an overview um, by, by Kate Graney, who's gonna, who's gonna give us kind of an overview discussion and presentation about uh, the post-Soviet transformation from her perspective. So let me hand over the virtual floor now to you, Kate, uh, to take us through your pres presentation. Great, thank you so much, Adam, I appreciate it. Um, and, and thank you uh, everyone who's joining us today. Um, so yes, uh, as Adam mentioned, this, this presentation is actually gonna be based on um, uh, my book that came out in uh, 2019, um, which looks at these 30 years and specifically looks at this question of um, what do we see when we look at the different um, uh, paths forward from transition, specifically in the former Soviet states. Um, when I was looking at this uh, question or wanted to undertake this study, um, it uh, came as my role as a teacher. I always had a, a trouble putting together a syllabus uh, to look at post-Soviet states. I mean, you could pull together things from um, lots of places, but I thought there might be some utility in trying to, to look at uh, a more um, synthetic uh, look at all the ex republics at Russia um, and their engagement with Europe. Um, this came originally out of my uh, field work in the 1990s in Tatarstan um, with a lot of my, my friends and um, uh, folks I would talk to in Tatarstan. Uh, this idea about Europeanness and civility um, came up over and over again uh, in terms of their understanding of what the post-Soviet world might look like, where Tatarstan might fit in that, um, as Muslims uh, in the new Europe, what might they look like? Um, so that always, Colonel was always in the back of my head that there was something really important about the, the, the uh, model of Europe and the aspiration to Europeanness, even in places like Kazan and, and um, uh, so I always wanted to, to look at that um, more closely. Um, for folks who are interested in the broader study, uh, I actually have five theoretical chapters about the question of Europe and Europeanness and what does that mean in the for former Soviet space. And then there are case studies of um, all the, the republics. Um, so the way I sort of look at this, this 30 years and you know, we're, we're talking about three sets of actors. Um, we're looking broadly at Europe, right? At European actors. And by that, I mean both official uh, EU Europeans, gatekeepers, right? EU and NATO um, folks in charge of enlargement, um, but also the idea of Europe um, and, and this question of Europeanness and is there still an aspiration to that and why? Um, same thing, right? Russia, policymakers in Russia. Um, I think R Russia historically, economically, politically, geographically is big enough, um, important enough uh, to stand on its own as an actor in this 30-year um, period, obviously. Uh, and then again, right, the question of, of Russia as an idea um, and uh, how does that influence policy and for each of the republics, then also I looked at them um, both through the lens of interest, right, political interest, um, security, prosperity, uh, but also identity. And I was very interested in these questions of what pulled them, uh, if or not, um, towards the idea of uh, understanding themselves as European um, and why. Um, I also argue that we should have an expanded idea of Europeanization um, while existing accounts of Europeanization, rightly so, um, look at the concept chiefly as enlargement um, and the achievement of EU or, or NATO membership. And I think just what we've seen in the past few days, um, I'm sure um, my colleagues will talk more about this uh, in terms of Ukrainian rhetoric about NATO and, and making that, that you know, desire for membership even more concrete. Um, and so certainly that's a big part of, of um, these processes. And I think one of the most interesting things to emerge over the past 30 years is the gradations of membership and belonging that we have seen emerge, the different ways of uh, not 
not wanting to say no definitively, but also not wanting to say yes definitively. And so we find more and more gradations of um, how you're sort of in NATO, you're sort of in the EU, you know, from um, the, the uh, Eastern Partnership, and then, well, we were going to enhance the Eastern Partnership, but, you know, so that's interesting. But then there are also, I think, other ways um, that we can look at to try to understand what Europe means to uh, actors in the former Soviet Union. Um, things like uh, uh, the world of sport, right? The Euro championships, um, things like Eurovision, um, but then also narratives of belonging about Europeanness, claims made in history textbooks, claims made um, in education curriculum and culture. Um, those kinds of things I think are meaningful to look at as well. Um, in terms of kind of an organizing uh, device that I think is, is useful in trying to understand um, what's happened over the past 30 years, and here I'm informed by the work of Martin Malia and um, Gershon Kron and, and Ernest Gellner, right, who um, identify this mental map that is very uh, uh, evident to all of us, um, where uh, trying to understand, you know, this, this where Europe begins, what is Europe, um, and uh, uh, sort of a declivity, right, that was Malia's word, a declivity um, or a gradient that posits that Europe is some kind of pinnacle, Europe is the apex, and then as one goes uh, east and, and south, one approaches something called the, the Orient, um, obviously informed, you know, very much um, by Said's work as well. Um, you know, lots of people have looked at this over the past 30 years, right? So ba Bacic and Bacic's Haydn's work on, on talks about this as a symbolic geography in, in the Balt, uh, excuse me, the Balkans, right? The idea of nesting Orientalisms. Um, Halid, uh, his work on Central Asia talks about this as a flexible and shifting dichotomy between Europe and the other. Um, Attila Mele's work in, in Hungary talks about this as a type of civilizational ruler that, that people use to measure themselves. Um, and Michael Hertzfeld, the anthropologist who works on Greece, talks about it as a hegemonic scale um, against which people are, are uh, in countries are measuring themselves. Um, so this kind of what I call it, it's clunky, but it, you know, that's what I came up with, the, the European Orientalist cultural gradient. Um, what we're talking about is roughly, right, a, a, some kind of understanding of what true Europe and true Europeanness is, um, you know, something called Central Europe or, or Middle Europa, right? Um, something called Eastern Europe, which is, you know, what I love about your project is trying to figure out, well, what is the new Eastern Europe? What was the old Eastern Europe? Um, you know, the Balkans as fitting in there somewhere, um, Russia, right, having its own um, positionality there. And then, um, you know, what is what is the true Orient, right? And, and how does that work as a reference at the other um, no node uh, in this scale? And so in you know, understanding this kind of symbolic geography or mental map that that folks are working with, you know, we're talking about geography, history, religion, culture are all used to, you know, figure out where people are positioned um, here. Um, one of the ways that I, I, uh, I really like um, Bacic and Bacic's Haydn works about the nested Orientalisms. Um, Jacques Rupnik referred to this as the phenomenon of um, folks who are positioned along the scale uh, are always comparing themselves with one another and figuring out where they fit. And one is always someone else's barbarian, right? That, you know, one, the point is to be um, further up than the next person, even if you can't be um, at, the, at the apex. Um, and then there's, of course, the special case of Russia in all of this as both positioned on this gradient um, and identified by Gershon Kron and Gel uh, Gelner and Malia as you know, certainly um, in some way lacking or some way not European. Um, obviously, since Peter, that's been the the, the story, right? Um, but then also replicating this within its space, right? Um, first as the Russian Empire, and and then certainly as the Soviet Union. Then you know, replicating the this sort of mental map within the boundaries of the Soviet Union and the the Tsarist Empire itself, right? With the Baltics occupying a certain realm and, and the Central Asian republics occupying um, another realm and, and everything in between. I should also mention Larry Wolf's work on Eastern Europe, of course, is really central to this um, as well. Um, in terms of making sense uh, chronologically of the past 30 years, um, I think we can divide it um, in, you know, roughly into three decades, right? A, uh, 
the first 10 years of, of what I call euphoria um, from roughly uh, 89 to 99 with um, the uh, uh, sessions um, that occurred that year. Um, a sort of truncated middle period of um, continued expansion, right? That includes the Big Bang in the EU um, uh, and then, you know, ends, is punctuated tragically with the events in Georgia. Um, and then roughly in the past decade um, or so, uh, of what I call the Europhobic um, uh, decade. What, what do I mean by this? What um, uh, characterizes each of these periods? Um, I think if we're talking about the first decade uh, in terms of what is happening along this symbolic geography, um, I think as they come out of the Soviet period, I think each of the, the new republics um, brings with itself and is also viewed by Europe as having a particular degree of sort of what I call intrinsic Europeanness, um, according to their individual histories, cultures, geographies, right? So each of the republics understands themselves in a particular way and is perceived by Europe in a particular way. Um, in terms of, of Europe and, and Europe's approach to this uh, region in the early decade, and um, this is based on Frank Schimmelfennig's work, um, of course, uh, I think we, there's, I appreciate his argument that what we see is European institutions um, uh, sort of being entrapped. Uh, that's the uh, his would be the bad way of putting it. We could say guided in a more positive way um, by their own commitments uh, to the idea of Europe as a community of values that had made these commitments to um, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and potentially places in the former Soviet Union as. Um, their true home as we're just waiting for you when you uh, are free and democratic. And, you know, um, so that's sort of what was going on with them in that first decade. Um, and then, of course, there were instrumental concerns on the, the parts of both of these sets of actors as well, right? So um, we've got identity issues and we also have um, instrumental concerns about um, uh, strengthening institutions in the uh, wake of the end of the Cold War, um, the desire of individual European states to maximize their political and economic advantages, and of course the desire of the republics to um, to to do the same. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I talk about in this uh, first period, in terms of uh, what happened with expansion, and you know, so this was, of course, um, Havel and Lenart Mary and and others, you know, making the argument that well, you told us that um, you were there waiting for us, right? And, and um, now we're here <laughs> and we belong. And, you know, so cap uh, capitalizing on Kundera's work about sort of the captivity thesis and things like that. Um, so that's what uh, was going on in that, that first decade. Um, and then what we, what we see happen uh, in the middle uh, decade, right? When we've got um, uh, the Big Bang happens, right? In, in 2004, and so we have, um, you know, most of the states of the old Warsaw Pact at that point in both the EU and NATO. And we have, of course, the um, very significant entrance of the Baltic states. Um, and, you know, that that being uh, 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 the first time that those institutions have expanded into the former Soviet sphere um, proper. And what I argue happens then um, to this kind of mental map of, of who is Europe and who isn't, is that once you have the former Warsaw Pact states and now the Baltic states in Europe, right? They have achieved it. They are members. Um, they, their arguments about being European have been accepted. Then there is, there is um, an impulse to redefine what Europe is and kind of make it clearer who's part of Europe and who isn't and to make it clear that Russia's not, right? Or that, you know, we're, um, I think during that first decade and this also goes with, you know, the, the discourse Gorbachev had forwarded about coming back to our common European home and things like that. Um, you know, some, the new Europeans um, are, are making it clear that maybe Russia should not be part of this new, this new larger Europe. Um, and then you also have, because of the, the victory or the success of the Baltic states, you have places like Ukraine, uh, Ukraine Moldova and, and Georgia starting to push for kind of enhanced position and, and recognition that they too, um, you know, have a path forward, um, potentially. 
Uh, and so in terms of institutions, right, you get Poland, um, uh, Czech Republic, Hungary pushing for more, more um, of a status for other post-Soviet states beyond the Baltics. Eventually in 2009, this will culminate in the Eastern Partnership. Um, just at, at the same time that you have other republics um, realizing that that is not going to be their strategy. There is no way forward in that sense. Um, and, you know, the uh, Central Asian states, I think, would fall into this category and more of us seeking protection from Russia, not don't see any kind of path forward in, in Europe and really have no desire for it. Um, I think the, the enlargement um, during this period in terms of who is potentially European moves beyond just Moldova, Ukraine, um, and uh, Belarus, of course, into the, the Caucasus states um, as, as well. Uh, in terms of what's happening in, in terms of instrumental concerns during this decade, uh, the, the successful Europeanization in some post-communist states and even in the Baltics, right, um, enhances the attractiveness of the European model for um, the six states who go on to become part of the Eastern Partnership. At the same time that that success um, means that Russia begins to see even more clearly um, the very concept of Europe and the concept of Europeanization, not as a potential um, path forward, but as a potent threat, right, to its own security. Um, this period, of course, also coincides with the emergence of the Putin regime. Um, and again, I think it's, I talk in, in, the, in the book, and I think it's interesting to note that relatively rapid, um, you know, journey from Putin going and addressing the German parliament in German and talking about Europe, Europe, Europe to by 2008, right, we have the invasion of Georgia um, to, to try to put a stop to this enhanced Europeanization project um, in Georgia and the, and the Caucasus. Uh, then, you know, in terms of what we've seen in the, in the past decade, um, you know, I think we see a, a further reconfiguration of this mental map in terms of who is European and, and who isn't and what Europe stands for. Um, in the in the Baltics, Ukraine and, and Georgia, uh, you know, you see an even deeper commitment to their Europeanness and to becoming uh, understanding themselves as part of this civilization as part of this um, mental space civilizational space and not <laughs> a Russian identified one. Um, at the same time that some of the post-communist states, particularly Hungary, Poland, um, are starting to redefine what Europe means, right? Pushing back on the sort of liberal values-based um, uh, Europe, right? So what we were, uh, what we're seeing, unfortunately, in terms of, you know, well, why don't we have an illiberal Europe, right? Well, why can't we be in a liberal part of Europe? Um, so we're seeing that type of pressure on, on this understanding of what Europe is uh, in the past decade. Um, we've seen the, you know, Baltics, Ukraine, and, and Georgia continue to push for um, a, a values-based uh, understanding of Europe that would be open to states that are committed to democracy um, and, and um, to a NATO, uh, you know, multilateral vision of, of security at the same time that we see Hungary and Poland, um, sometimes in concert with, sometimes, of course, uh, against um, Russia also uh, pushing for um, change or challenging of the, the values-based uh, institutions in Europe. Uh, at the same time that Russia's use of, of military force in Georgia, and then of course, you know, tragically beginning in 2013 in, in Ukraine, uh, makes EU calculations of interest regarding Europeanization much more difficult for post-Soviet states, right? So, um, these different, uh, the, the calculus changes, right, um, in terms of, of uh, the, re the um, realisticness or, or how realistic these desires and claims, both for symbolic and for actual membership in Europe are um, uh, at the same time that, you know, the desire for them remains. Um, in terms of, you know, what do we see as we are heading into a fourth um, post-communist decade? Uh, Sadly, as we're all living through, right, we are seeing the, I think, the, the breakdown of um, the liberal international order and the reassertion of, of notions of the nation state, isolationism, realpolitik. Uh, we see that at the level of international institutions. We see that at the level of Europe. We're seeing that in the United States. Um, you know, I think we're seeing the continued weakness of the transition paradigm, right, or the or questioning of the transition paradigm. 
Um, and I put a question mark there because I'm I'm not sure we should be giving up on it yet. Um, I think we need to reconceptualize it. But um, and now we've got right the the COVID nineteen aftershocks and and what will that do to um, the further you know will it further these breakdowns? Will it you know is is it leading to a reassert uh, a renewed interest in liberal institutions and commitment to liberal values? You know, obviously we don't know. It's a, it's an open question. Um, I want, I think I want to argue that there are reasons to persist with our focus on Europeanization as a potential and, and Europeanization as a, a form of transition. I think it's still worth saving that concept, worth focusing on that concept, perhaps with new and renewed, um, commitment. Uh, you know, I think is Europe still worth fighting for? Right. And again, a, a question mark, um, which Europe, what are we talking about? Um, obviously we can have endless critiques of European fecklessness, corruption, um, uh, and, and certainly we have folks who are trying to now redefine Europe as, you know, illiberal and, and xenophobic and Christian, you know, Christian and, and family values based and all of that. So we have to, you know, which Europe are we talking about? Um, but I think... I would make the case that the 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 vision of a uh, a tolerant liberal institution based Europe is worth fighting for, and that you know we what we are seeing in Poland, what we are seeing in in Russia with the protests, what we are seeing in Belarus with the the protests, what we are seeing in Ukraine, right, is itself evidence that that Europe is still worth fighting for, that that vision still means something to people. Um, especially when we consider that the alternatives are so much worse, right? I mean, if there's, you know, any bright side at all to what we are seeing in this kind of parade of horrors uh, across the post-Soviet space, across the American space, you know, it's that the alternatives to this kind of liberal vision as, as problematic as that liberal vision is, and as many caveats as we have to attach to it, is it still, you know, um, the best thing we we have going? Um, I do think there's a lot of interesting work being done on this question of the alternatives to a transition paradigm, right? Or how might we redefine this? Uh, our understanding of of even you know post-Soviet and becoming European. Uh, the uh, Martin Mueller and um, some of the folks associated with Eurasian geography and economics are uh, trying to get, uh, doing some interesting research on this concept of the global East, right? As opposed to um, Europeanization. So not such a, it's, it's an interesting way to sort of rethink um, the kind of second world uh, vision of, of post um, communist spaces. Uh, it, so there's a lot of interesting stuff about, you know, trying to decenter um, the North South, um, dichotomy and and sort of open up the east to something that is beyond eastern europe right so sort of the global east as um neither north nor south uh but not necessarily bound just to post-soviet spaces um so that's an interesting idea um you know i think there's some interesting things to be done in terms of maybe thinking about new balances of power new spheres of influence um Certainly part of that is what is the new Europe looking like and what might the new Europe look like. Um, obviously, we have to attend to Europe, uh, sorry, Russia's self-understanding, its desire for a sphere of influence, who, who is being bound to that in what ways, um, both against their will and perhaps um, more voluntarily. And I think they're, you know, interesting um, to look at what's happening in Central Asia in terms of, um, a, you know, new regional block, uh, block around China, potentially, um, you know, uh, uh, so, um, so those are my thoughts about, um, where we've been. Um, it's a, it's a big question, <laughs> uh, and there's, you know, a lot to, to talk about, but that's my, my thoughts about what has been happening, um, in the past 30 years, and, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, um, hearing from my colleagues, who have a much more, um, that was a pretty bird's eye view. And, and so I'm looking forward to hearing my colleagues who have a much more um, uh, on the ground view of what's happening in these places. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, so much uh, for that. It was uh, really good, I think, to show this 
uh, framework of understanding, and I really appreciated the, 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 the three uh, kind of decades of understanding the, the approaches to Europeanization in the region. Um, and I do, I do think that question, what next, is really what, uh, what we can maybe get to the core of our discussion uh, in a little bit, uh, especially looking at some of the really big um, events that have taken place in the region of, of you know, the post-Soviet space, uh, we think about Belarus, uh, of course, Ukraine, uh, even Moldova and Georgia and others. Uh, we can even think about Azerbaijan, Armenia, and, and then the, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh. So constant changes, constant uh, uh, different factors influencing these processes. And where will it go? Of, of course, COVID and the pandemic is, is another of those big, big uh, factors which will, which will influence. Um, so now I want to move now for our commentary, which uh, on specific countries, and uh, of course we could have a whole, you know, week-long discussion on on this topic because it really is fascinating, and I know that we will continue to be discussing these issues at New Eastern Europe. But I wanted to really get input on the three countries that are the closest, let's say, in terms of as Kate was talking about the Europeanization, uh, and these are the the countries who have signed association agreements with the European Union. Uh, via their membership in the Eastern Partnership, uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and Moldova, a lot has always has already been happening in these countries as well, uh, even recently. And so I want now to hand the floor over to Olga Anuk uh, for her uh, commentary, reaction, and uh, and and her perspective on uh, the 30 years of transformation uh, from 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 Ukraine. Olga, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you very much, Adam. And uh, Kate, you, you had this enormous job to do 30 years across many different countries. 30 years across one country is difficult enough. Um, there's a few things that I wanna say what I won't be talking about. I won't be talking about Ukraine being in a state of transition because I do not believe Ukraine is. I believe Ukraine transitioned to democracy. I do believe it was in different periods of democratization or maybe backsliding, but really increasingly we're talking about democratic quality, deepening democracy in Ukraine and further democratization of a variety of aspects and no longer whether or not it is a democracy. Second thing, I won't be talking about whether Ukraine is in Europe or European because it is in Europe and it is European and most Ukrainians see themselves as such and have always done so. Um, whether it is in the EU, we know the answer to that, it is not. Um, and that's a very different thing. The concept of being European, being part of a broader shared community of European values is one thing, being a member to the European Union is another. And here I just wanna highlight some uh, interesting numbers. In just since the Euromaidan in 2014, uh, support amongst Ukrainians for joining NATO, um, the more, the, more, uh, uh, the, the more problematic of the two memberships, perhaps. Uh, in 2014, according to our data from our USAPS projects with uh, Henry Hale, Tim Colton, and Nadia Kravitz, only 30% of Ukrainians wanted Uk to see Ukraine become a member of NATO. In our project with Gwen Stasa and others uh, from data in 2019, we see that this number went up to 40% of Ukrainians wanting to join NATO. We just got some fresh data from uh, uh, February, and I can report to you that in 2021, 55% of Ukrainians would like to see Ukraine join NATO. This is prior to the most recent weeks of escalating talks about NATO membership. So that is really interesting in itself. When it comes to EU membership, in 2014, directly after the Euromaidan, when EU was a hot, top, hot topic um, and on everyone's minds, 50% of Ukrainians wanted to become, wanted to see Ukraine become a member of the EU. From our data in Mobilize in 2019, we see that this number went up at a statistically significant level to 54% of Ukrainians. Here's the headline story, 2021, our data from the Mobilize project clearly shows that 63% of the Ukrainian population would like to see Ukraine join uh, the EU. So Ukraine is in some form of democracy, no matter how, how problematic and with adjectives that may be. It is European, 
Whether it will be in the EU is a different scenario, but it certainly is something that at least most Ukrainians want. And if you think 63 is not a very high number, then please take a look at the Pew data over the past few years about favorability towards the European Union from other EU members, where the medium for all uh, members is actually 62, so slightly under what currently the Ukrainian population sees. So why am I saying this? Because the story of the last 30 years of politics in Ukraine is a story of this country that overcame multiple worst case ex scenario expectations, right? One was Ukraine is a divided society along ethnic and linguistic lines, and therefore a lot of people expected it not only uh, to break up in parts, but really to see an ongoing ethnic conflict. Another expectation, worst case scenario, was that Ukraine had this weak civil society. It had no history of major people power. There was a perception that, that, that there was an absence of a public sphere. And it was expected that this would be a major impediment to democratization processes. Third, it was perceived to be this typical post-Soviet oligarchy, and obviously oligarchy was expected not only to be problematic for democratization, but to lead to authoritarianism in the country. And fourth, uh, Ukraine in the 1990s specifically, saw a period of uh, post-Soviet deindustrialization and a really corrupt privatization, as we know, obviously connected to that oligarchy element. And therefore it was expected that not only would these two elements lead to radicalized politics in the country, but also that Ukraine would be, uh, would quite likely face full economic collapse, especially um, considering uh, aggressive neighbor tactics that would only escalate this, and therefore an aggressive neighbor would be able to make use of economic collapse and co-opt or even control Ukraine. But somehow, over and over, Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine, it's politicians, it's this, this country that just keeps taking everyone by surprise. And I can say some anecdotal stories here, and Adam, I'm sure, knows several uh, as well, and, and many of you might uh, in, in my panelists or fellow audience members. Um, but even big name politicians and public figures uh, are taken by surprise. I'm thinking of one particular Polish politician that was taken by surprise in, in terms of his expectations of what would happen on the Yevromaidan tomorrow. He was indeed quite wrong. And most recently, if you are Eastern Europe Twitter followers, you know of another uh, quite public figure that got it wrong. But jokes aside, we all get things wrong sometimes, but let's discuss what we got wrong why we got it wrong, where we are today, and perhaps where are we going in Ukraine. So this divided society along ethnic and linguistic lines. Well, really, it's, I think, the most important thing uh, to keep in mind uh, why ethnic war did not, in fact, break out in Ukraine, uh, ethnic conflict did not break out in Ukraine. It's because most people completely misunderstood the role of linguistic diversity in Ukraine. And no matter how hard Putin tries to apply this logic to the Ukrainian context, perhaps it has worked to a lesser or greater extent in different republics in, in, in the region. Uh, and let's be clear also, Ukraine's own politicians have helped uh, this myth take hold in their public political discourses um, and also allowed this myth to take hold in the West. But it's certainly, it's, it, is, it certainly is important to note that data over the last 30 years, but specifically the data from our projects, whether it be from our IBIF or um, our USEPS project with Henry Hale, um, Gwen Sasa, and Volodya Kulik, where we clearly note over and over again that ethnicity and ethnic identity do not overlap very neatly with language practices or even language identity in Ukraine. And therefore, it is not a very useful proxy for other partisan or policy preferences. Most importantly, our misunderstanding of the ro role of linguistic diversity in Ukraine has led to, uh, for I think for a great deal of people, to underestimate the role and centrality of a strong sense of civic identity. That when we look at the data over 30 years, it has been actually mapped over and over again. Ukrainians have a very strong point of unity around civic identity. Um, 
And this is the nationalism actually that is understudied, I think, in Ukraine, the civic nationalism, which is quite profound, and it is not along, uh, it does not cut uh, neatly along ethnic or linguistic lines. But I think the next step in Ukraine here is for us to better understand regional variation and divergence in the country. Regional variation and divergence does not, again, fully map on or very neatly map on to linguistic or ethnic identities, as reported by Ukrainians in a variety of means, be it surveys, interviews, focus groups, and so on. But what we do see is that there's socioeconomic inequalities and different political economic systems within the region that seem to underpin uh, diversity in partisan support, policy preferences, as well as political, political engagement. And I think this is the next frontier of understanding where Ukrainian democracy will take us and to understand this variation among the regions. Now, this weak, weak civil society and no history of people power, you know, uh, expecting this to deter democratization processes in Ukraine. Wow, <laughs> people couldn't have gotten something more wrong than this. Um, uh, 16 years ago, when I began to research uh, social mobilization, um, protests and activism in Ukraine, you know, everyone was pretty certain that th this was the case in Ukraine. Ukraine, I don't think really ever truly had a weak civil society. I think there's problems with the influence civil society might have had in the policy sector. Uh, but I don't uh, agree with the, the, the proposition that it was indeed weak. I think, in fact, Ukraine is an outlier in the region today. Um, when it comes to both civil society, social movements, and protest or people power. But I also believe that it was perhaps always uh, an outlier, even in the Soviet period too. And I think this history of activism and mobilization and its legacy from the Soviet period is often mis uh, often overlooked by a great deal of scholars. And therefore, we were often surprised when we saw um, a million plus people in the streets of Kiev and other major cities across the country. Um, and so we know that Ukraine sort of is now understood as the place where protest seems to always happen. But being the place where protest always seems to happen is indeed a double-edged sword. Um, you know, the questions, will we see protest fatigue? Will we see post multi Maidan disenchantment amongst the electorate and the, the citizens? Tucker and Mierkowitz wrote a really great paper on this, um, identifying the expectations, the theoretical expectations that indeed we would see this fatigue and disenchantment. But again, our data don't show this. Um, in fact, there are more people willing to join a protest that, today than there were in 2014. And uh, I, I will tell you that this is incredibly shocking. Our most recent data uh, having been collected in the middle of one of the most severe lockdowns um, in, in Ukraine, uh, we see a huge <laughs> uh, increase in willingness to protest against the government should it be necessary. In 2019, April 2019, uh, 38.5 or so percent were uh, incomplete or somewhat in agreement with the uh, notion that if needed, I am willing and ready to protest against the government. Um, in the first lockdown, uh, April 2020, right, you know, when we were all very frightened about what COVID is and we were first experiencing lockdowns ourselves, that number declined just ever so slightly and we were already impressed with how, how small that decline was to 32%. But our January, February data from 2021 show us that 56% of the Ukrainian population is ready and willing to protest against the government should it be necessary. Nevertheless, if people are increasingly willing to protest, what does that say about the quality of democracy in Ukraine? Moreover, we have data on whether or not they feel this is the only way to see change in the government. And increasingly, more and more people, although it's uh, fewer than 20%, see that this is the only way to change a government. That indeed is problematic for the quality of democracy in Ukraine. Oligarchy and its uh, expectations. Well, I think here the one thing I want to say about the misunderstandings uh, about oligarchy. It's far too often that oligarchs are looked at in the zero-sum, black and white, pro-EU, pro-Russian, 
Um, of course, the story is much more complicated. I recommend everyone to read Sergei Zhuk's wonderful book about rock and roll in the Rocket City, about the Dnipropetrovsk clan, as it were. But really, Ukrainian oligarchs want to be a big fish in their own Black Sea. They do not want to be small fish in Putin's private pond. So I think sometimes this uh, misunderstanding that Eastern oligarchs are pro Putin, pro Russia, and 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 want to join the 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 Russian political. Um, um, landscape, I think that's mistaken. And I think very few people actually spoke with uh, those individuals who say these things. They want access to EU markets. They want access to global markets. They want to be global players. And they also want to legitimate their wealth and philanthropic foundations uh, to a broader audience. But perhaps most importantly in Ukraine, and maybe what saved Ukraine throughout these different moments of backsliding is that there is a multipolarity of economic and political power. And this, uh, we can look at Sibelis's really interesting work on why this would be important when we compare the Ukrainian and Russian context. Really, this multipolarity of oligarchic clans, as they are often referred to in the case of Ukraine, has saved it from a concentration of power. And what maybe Yanukovych or Putin um, or other outside observers may have repeatedly misunderstood, even perhaps Poroshenko at times, is that in Ukraine, you need, if you are a, a, a political leader, a member of the political or economic elite, an oligarch yourself, you need to compromise often. You need uh, the most successful politicians were the ones who were able to manage these different um, uh, competing needs amongst the political and economic elite and organize and co coordinate the oligarchs. And Kuchma was particularly apt at this, um, a really impressive politician in that regard. Um, Lastly, well, the, one of the last things I want to talk about is this uh, post-Soviet deindustrialization and corrupt privatization, right? And this did not, in fact, lead to the radicalized politics that it may have in other um, parts of the region or the world. But yes, uh, Ukraine is indeed a lower economic country. Ukraine is very poor. Ukrainians are rather poor, right? Um, and whilst there has been some incremental uh, ra rises of poverty rates, for instance, since 2014, for many Ukrainians, the quality of life has decreased in the post-2014 context. Um, and specifically, we know that this has been the case for those living in the east and the south of the country. And we see clear evidence of this in a variety of data when we look at economic evaluations and perceptions and personal fi uh, family finance, uh, what, what people can afford in their households. Um, for now, this does not, this, this economic inequality and uh, disaffection does not seem to overlap neatly with any identity politics and discourses in Ukrainian in the Ukrainian context, but it is possible that it will. And this is this is, I think, of concern when we're looking, uh, we're asking the question about the direction of Ukrainian uh, democracy. Um, and certainly this element of economic inequalities and perceptions of economic experiences was a, the major explanation behind the Zelensky phenomenon and what many politicians got wrong. COVID context is obviously exacerbating this patterning. Uh, I'll tell you some really sad uh, data right here. 18.7% of the respondents in our survey say they themselves contracted COVID. And another 52% say they know someone who has, whereas 30%, and we, 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 we weight this to the Ukrainian population, 30% say that they know someone who has died from COVID. Now, of course, we're not, it's not clear how, how how you know fully we can believe these data, but these are quite rigorous data, and they are pointing to a very, very deep um, trauma uh, experience, not only around the world but certainly in Ukraine. Yet, with all this that I told you, seventy-one percent completely or somewhat agree that despite the health comp implications of COVID nineteen, they are most worried about the economic implications of the pandemic. And this is not because they are not afraid. 49% are very afraid of COVID. 
This is because they have been living over the last seven years in a deep economic recession with multiple crises, an ongoing war, and now this has been only exacerbated by COVID. And the thing that I want to, and this is our, our worry for where democracy will go in Ukraine. And I want to leave you with this last data point. Uh, in, when we started collecting our data, uh, only about 23% in 2019 wanted to leave the country. Today, this number is 38% we're seeing a massive increase also of people just willing to flee, no longer to fight if the fight is so difficult. And I'm gonna leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, Olga, uh, very much. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of data to, to, to go through and uh, I think showing the picture of how things aren't as uh, always as they are portrayed uh, outside Ukraine um, and breaking some of the stereotypes and I, I I, I want to get into some of the discussion, but just to keep it going, I'm going to move now to, to Bakar, uh, who's going to talk about uh, his perspective on, on, on Georgia. And, uh, and I, I, I assume maybe some of, some of the themes might be very similar to what we've already been hearing. Bakar, the floor is yours. Oh, okay, thanks, Adam, and hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, today I'll try to give a critical examination of the Georgia's experience of the post-Soviet transformation. So, uh, the, and democracy, yes, of course. And the post-Soviet transformation, or, or let's say the, the process of dual transition in Georgia was based on mostly ideological mechanism and which was conditioned by conscious or unconscious interest and position of the new uh, ruling class of post-Soviet system. And when I say new ruling class, I mean here uh, like communist organizers of perestroika or katastroika, as it was once ironically coined by Russian sociologist Alexander Zinoviev, and anti-communist reformers. Uh, so this class formed sort of alliance to create uh, the new capitalistic order and the new individual. And the ideology which defined and still defines Georgian democracy is called the neoliberalism, or let's say it more precisely, like post-Soviet neoliberalism. So in this way, democracy in post-Soviet Georgia is principally hijacked by the political, social, and the cultural doctrines of the neoliberal ideology. And the neoliberalism functions as an ideological monoculture for post-Soviet Georgia, and it is wrongly equated with the idea of the democracy already for last uh, more than 25 years, at least, I mean, if not more. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but of course it is not new for political and social theories that neoliberal ideology stands against the collective pathos of democracy. And it's because neoliberalism works for few, not for many. And a neoliberal state and neoliberal ideology provokes individualization and uh, it excludes the need of collective interest. And in this context, unsurprisingly, of course, the neoliberal ideology marginalizes the ideals of, uh, like, uh, it marginalizes and stigmatizes the ideals like social justice, equality, welfare for law. So basically all the ideas, all the ideals which are important for proper functioning of democracy. But of course, uh, I understand that one may rightly claim that democracy has many forms in political theory. And in this way, what we may call democracy in post-Soviet Georgia, and I guess not only in post-Soviet Georgia, but in many other countries across the globe, not only in post-Soviet countries, is a neoliberal democracy, which is to say it again, like nihilistic with the principal pathos of democracy. At least it's skeptical with a pathos that is understood by ordinary citizens that democracy should work for all and not for just the financial or political uh, elites, yes? And what I would like also to underline is that the mentality of political institutions and administrative class and even social structures in Georgia are restricted and controlled by the canons of uh, either liberal or neoliberal ideology as a radical form of the liberalism, yes? And also if you make a closer inspection, Georgian democracy is the mirror of liberal hagiography which uh, says that institutions and legal norms are higher moral categories than human and human well-being. So it's not something new for liberal class and uh, 
for example, even prominent liberal thinker Ralph Darendorf revealed that liberals are concerned more with the means rather than ends, with democratic institutions and markets rather than human well being and humans in general. And uh, in Georgia, it's, it's something like the same. I mean, we see these rituals and lots of talks about democracy, but it does not really uh, affect, uh, it does not really have any impact over the, uh, the development, over the well being of the society. Because in Georgia, everybody speaks about democracy as an, as an empty signifier. For Georgian political class, democracy is a, is a doxa. It is something which everybody likes, everybody imitates, but nobody knows its real concept and what is needed to, to, uh, to uh, uh, build a strong immunity for democracy, yes? And for example, poverty and economic stagnation, which is the, 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 one of the most important threats and one of the most important enemies of democracy, are not considered to be a major problem. And uh, uh, it is considered to be a like, technical problem which should be solved by the government's neoliberal uh, programs. And this type of political thinking uh, is rooted from autocratic rule of uh, former president Saakashvili, uh, who promoted the idea of Georgian neoliberal democracy as, as a role model for other post-Soviet states. Of course, definitely neither Saakashvili nor today's political elites would tell you that they are neoliberal, but if we uh, observe the discourses and the language which they use, the language of massive privatization, deregulation, minimal state, uh, 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 liberal labor law, and so on, this all gives a uh, like, uh, picture, a portrait of Georgia's neoliberal democracy. And so uh, in post-Soviet Georgia, uh, neoliberal democracy is an ideological, uh, it's an ideological monster. Uh, it's an ideological monster, uh, uh, which uh, really, uh, which really uh, gives uh, lots of discourses uh, to marginalize the ideals of social justice, solidarity, equality. So the discourses apparatus of Georgian neoliberal democracy is to uh, decline these ideals as an anachronistic ideals. And by this method, it also ignores and it also stigmatizes the concept of public interest, of public goods, of collective needs. And in this method and in this way, it stands for the interest of private capital. Uh, for example, recently we have a uh, like large protest in Georgia, uh, which is related to uh, 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 which is related to this energy, uh, like unfair energy policy, for example. And uh, the, sadly, after Saakashvili, those discourses and practices uh, characterizing for uh, neoliberal democracy are still strong, and we see no rescue of Georgian democracy from um, this radical uh, liberal ideological pressure. Uh, when I mean radical liberal ideological, I mean here uh, neoliberalism because neoliberalism functions as a radical form of uh, the, the liberalism, yes. Also what happens in Georgia, it, it's about uh, the crisis of democracy in Georgia is also a reflection of the global crisis of democracy. As we all know, after uh, Cold War, it was Fukuyama who was fanatically arguing that there is the end of, the end of history and the liberal democracy is in triumph. But not really. I mean, uh, we see that democracy today, uh, at least uh, like modern contemporary Western liberal democracy is mutated into neoliberal democracy and it really does not correspond the needs of the society. Uh, and um, it cannot solve the problems. And, uh, and uh, like in the, all over the world, in Georgia, for example, uh, it also uh, recently appeared the precariat, so-called new dangerous class as Gary Standing coined it, uh, precariat as a, as a the, 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 the social class which has no economic stability, which are anxious and uh, who are uh, frequently the victim of social justice and inequality. And so, uh, and the Georgian uh, process of democratization, post-Soviet de post -Soviet democratization was highly influenced by external factors and by so-called deviant idea of democracy export, which really did not work because uh, the export of democracy is really the ideological project which has nothing to do with the, with the real world. Uh, because democracy simply needs the social uh, requisites uh, to, to, uh, to make it stronger, yes? Uh, from to, to, uh, 
to observe it from sociological perspective. Yes, it's economic growth, uh, it's about uh, industrialization, uh, and it's about good life, yes, which Georgia really do not experience from last 30 years. We have the de deindustrialization and we have economic stagnation and so on. And the moral preaching of, uh, of uh, wealthy Western countries and global institutions to poor country like Georgia is not really enough uh, to build a, uh, to, uh, to support the democracy, even more it is like cynical and uh, ironic approach, as it is also observed by many scholars uh, today. And I mean, uh, the, of course, in a way, democracy is exported in Georgia, and it's celebrated only as a carnival, as a carnival of, of uh, political and financial elites, and there are certain rituals and there are certain rules that are uh, respected by the political elites. And uh, it makes illusion that we have better democracy, for example, than other countries. Uh, so what are the social, economic and political consequences of Georgia's post-Soviet uh, uh, neoliberal democracy? It's about, uh, it's about poverty and inequality. It's about facade democracy and facade development because there are lots of illusions that the Georgian democracy is uh, like uh, is like a role model and so on. But this is a facade democracy, which in fact has nothing to do with the, with the, with the if we take uh, this uh, theory of Seymour Martin Lipset that good life means democracy, this narrative really does not work in this case. We got the idea of minimalistic state, which is uh, uh, completely without social responsibility. Uh, the minimalistic state, which makes society more disintegrated. And again, of course, no political elite in Georgia will tell you that uh, the government does, must not care to the society. But again, if you observe the practices and the practical policies which political elites are advocating, these policies uh, is transforming Georgia into, uh, not into welfare society, but into a radical individualized society. Uh, what, so I don't want to take lots of time because I know that I have 10 minutes. Uh, so, and I'll, I'll try to finalize. And to sum it up, that what, what should be done for, for the future in order to uh, save Georgian democracy? For, I mean, from my own perspective, Georgian democracy needs to be saved. And I would, I would like to say that there is a need of deconstruction and reconstruction. And what Georgian democracy needs is to emancipate itself from this neoliberal dogmatism, from this, again, from this um, fanatical ideas of deregulation, of individualized society, of, uh, of uh, the primacy of capital and private capital interests. And based on this, and based on dramatic experience of neoliberal transition, to reconstruct itself from the ideals of social progress and welfare for, for all. And how we do it, of course, one may answer. I believe that uh, there, are, there are certain strategies and ways to do it, but I believe that we need, the Georgian needs a mental gymnastics. A society must ask, society must ask questions to itself and to the political class also. We must const constantly ask what was wrong and how, and to make attempt to, uh, to make attempt for a greater transformation of social and political order. Of course, uh, I understand that the just political institutions um, produce just society. But of course, it is, it is society also who, who needs to uh, engage in this mental gymnastics because the Georgian political class is really stuck in this neoliberal past. And, uh, but, but of course, there is of, of perspectives that, uh, that uh, Political generations of future should understand this, the dramatic lessons and experience which we had and to, to make a bigger transformation, not only in social sphere, but also in a political field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bakar, uh, for your thoughts and reflections. I think we are definitely uh, provoking and, and uh, bringing up a lot of new ideas on re reflecting on the transformation, which is what really was the aim of our discussion. And I really do appreciate uh, this perspective as well and your ideas on how some things uh, could be fixed uh, uh, for, for Georgia. And I hope we can get a little bit, I know we're running already behind on time, but I think we can uh, go a little bit uh, longer if, if all of our viewers are okay with that. We have had also a pretty active discussion on the chat box uh, for those of you who are watching. So please also, uh, we, see your, we see your comments and we will uh, be addressing some of them as well. 
Um, okay, so the last uh, last uh, commentary I want to hand over now is to, to Denis about Moldova uh, and uh, the situation there. I, I already see a lot of common themes that are going through uh, the first three speakers. I'm sure we'll see some uh, as well, of course, individual uh, perspectives uh, of each of, of each of the, the, the countries and the speakers. But Denis, the, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to my, uh, to my colleagues. Many of, uh, many of the ideas that I wanted to say uh, were already mentioned, so I will try not to focus on, um, on those ideas, but rather bring something new uh, into our uh, discussion. Um, in my view, it's, uh, it's very useful to uh, look closer at uh, three elements of, of uh, what uh, actually our states are uh, comprised of. Uh, the state itself and the institutions, uh, the political system, uh, basically that, uh, that um, those people and uh, those uh, groups, political groups that are creating uh, and giving directions to the population. And last but not least, the population itself. Uh, so starting from the state and the, the building up of the statehood uh, in Moldova and in, un, in other places uh, on, on the post-Soviet uh, space was a very difficult, uh, very difficult uh, task for the, uh, for the politicians. Uh, first of all, because uh, they needed to create something from scratch. Uh, they didn't have, they were not equipped with the democratic knowledge about how to build uh, a democratic state. Um, everything was in a decay, uh, literally speaking, uh, because uh, what was uh, called by uh, Bakar uh, as uh, katastroika, this is exactly what, what happened. Um, the recipes which were given to, uh, to the new political elites were not, uh, were not sufficiently applicable for, for the countries in the region because uh, they, were, uh, they were having a different uh, destination and meaning inside the USSR. So we had a more agricultural uh, Moldova and probably Georgia as well, and then a very in industrialized Ukraine, and then less uh, or more, uh, more, uh, more countries uh, that were uh, providing resources from Central Asia. So we had different states from the very beginning. Their economies were... were uh, having different structures. So we needed different tools and different uh, solutions for, for creating new states. And this was something which, which was uh, a, a missing point from the very beginning. We didn't have any kind of Marshall plan for the region. There was no clarity where the region should go. It was important to, to bring more democracy in this, uh, in this newly, uh, let's say, illiberated uh, countries from, uh, from autocracy. And um, this was the first, uh, first goal. And it was, in a way, quite successful. But it was a very facade-like uh, approach because we, we introduced democracy <laughs> without actually understanding that neither the political class nor the citizens are used to this. Uh, so we had to have probably more support from the West, and this is something which, which also uh, was lacking with, uh, in regard with, uh, with Russia. Because uh, though Russia was not anymore, let's say, uh, the, um, uh, the driving motor or device for the entire region, because it was coping with its own problems, which are very many, uh, oligarchy, corruption, poverty, um, social, let's say, the, the loss of social capital, the loss of social and economic welfare, and many, many other macroeconomic issues which, which were uh, affecting the, the Russian uh, functioning as a newly created state. But the same things were happening and were somehow replicating. They were uh, very much influencing the, the, the former republics because the uh, still Moscow was in a way a guiding, um, was giving this guiding, uh, um, elements to how to to actually start from the very beginning the uh, the work on on a new state and for Moldova um, the problem the problem was that many crises uh, coincided so we had the uh, national renaissance and we had a huge debate around the identity of of, of the uh, of the nation uh, do we speak about Moldovan nation or actually this nation is identical to the Romanian one so probably there is sense to really seriously discuss how to uh, reconstruct the Romanian statehood. And here we had a lot of uh, political confrontations, which actually also, uh, um, which also nurtured 
the separatism in Transnistrian region and in Gagauzia inside uh, on the right bank of, of, of uh, the Dniester River. Um, this was one crisis. Then we had the social economic crisis, which was, uh, which was triggered by uh, very inefficient, uh, in my view, mass privatization uh, that again, led to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, transfer of public of public assets to the people and groups which were again either having very narrow interest and here we we probably should uh, somehow remind how the oligarchy uh, oligarchy groups actually uh, arose uh, because it was starting from the wrong uh, wrong steps in the privatization and this also led to, let's say, misappropriation, misuse, uh, mismanagement of the public assets because people were happy with the, with getting something out of nothing because everything was collapsed. They lost jobs, they lost their saving, savings, they lost their revenues, they needed to migrate. And the migration was again towards Russia because of the language uh, affinities and the understanding of the how actually this post-Soviet space uh, which means also institutions, it means also mentality, uh, it means uh, not only language, so much more than that. So a set of, of, of values as well. So that's why we still uh, now in 2021 are very, um, feel this um, uh, nostalgia and have nostalgic uh, views about so many things that we, we have experienced during the Soviet time because, uh, because the soft power that the USSR had is still working, uh, continue to work in, in today. So nowadays we have political parties that are trying to still capital, capitalize uh, political support using those uh, elements of nostalgia that are still uh, in place and in the minds of, of that, uh, let's say older generation that is now uh, in a way uh, losing, of course, uh, uh, political and, 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 and social visibility because of uh, obviously aging and uh, and the depopulation in general new generations are coming out so uh, we have a, a qualitative uh, request for changing the narratives for changing the institutions for modernizing the institutions and the here is when the uh, the political parties are struggling because many of them are still represented by those uh, let's say post soviet um, elites, uh, many of whom worked uh, during the uh, during the Soviet time, nomenklatura, or those who uh, who uh, actually replaced them. We have very few newly created political parties that came out of discontent uh, in in the 2010, 2016 uh, uh, situation related to the uh, the collapse of the collapse of the. Uh, of the banking uh, banking sector, which was provoked by the uh, by the banking fraud. Uh, thanks God, uh, we we managed to uh, to maintain stability. Now the financial system is doing much better. But that happened because of European integration. So uh, I will come uh, a little bit later to the importance of European integration as a compass that that show in a way a direction towards reforms, towards modernization, and towards. Uh, some sort of prosperity. But now going back to the political parties, um, so we have very young political parties that are now becoming stronger and uh, that are getting stronger on the political landscape. They are trying now to uh, re review and, re uh, and uh, redraw the rules of game because we didn't have rules of game for a long time. And now it's important not only to, to uh, reanimate and have this uh, shock therapy, which was very common in the 90th, yeah, in the 80th and 90th in Central uh, in Central Europe and uh, later on in uh, in Eastern Europe. But now we need a sort a, a kind of uh, shock therapy for for the current days when we have uh, state capture phenomenon, where we have oligarchic uh, groups that are controlling institutions or those institutions that are adopting laws and are setting up uh, policy uh, policy procedures. Uh, so this is something which also comes with the political parties because nobody can, nobody else than political parties, local political parties can actually implement this, uh, this very nice, uh, nicely sounding uh, desiderat that the EU and in general the Western uh, institutions are proclaiming for, for our region as well. Uh, 
Um, so the political parties are in a way in the process of renaissance as well. It, it, it takes place quite, uh, quite late because it's a kind of third decade. Yeah, we are talking about uh, approaching the 30 years old. So if to judge uh, at a, a comparing it to a person, um, individual then we should have this uh, done already. Now it's a little bit too late, but still it's very important to, to work on, on changing the face of the political parties. And this comes with new elites. And uh, fortunately for Moldova, these new elites are coming from diaspora or those people who were educated abroad. And this creates a uh, new, or this brings in new, um, new approaches the uh, integrity of these politicians, the fact that they earn their money through work, not through uh, schemes, gray schemes by uh, embezzlement or mismanaging public uh, property. And, uh, and also uh, we have the, the, the face in, in, um, in the, um, the, the face, the, the age of the, of the politicians is also becoming younger. And this, uh, this creates new perspectives for those who are going to vote because there is also a fatigue among the voters who, see, who have seen the same face for many years and they don't trust politicians because they don't trust their leaders. Unfortunately, uh, Moldova is very much, uh, is very much uh, ruled uh, or driven by the uh, importance of a strong leadership and not the political party as such, because the ideological parties are very weak in, in, in Moldova. We have rather geopolitical political parties than ideological ones. So in this case, we need to rely on, on politicians and therefore uh, attracting new, uh, new faces and bringing probably more, uh, more people who are educated, who are raised in, in, in the West, it's, it's a very important step forward. And then, uh, moving to, to the population that I mentioned several times, but I would like to focus on, on this uh, ingredient for a successful statehood. Um, we, we have to take into account the, the fact that as, uh, as Kate mentioned in the very beginning, we had a sort of tragedy uh, that, that a lot of, uh, or several generations have felt. I was still young I, as a child. I, uh, I didn't really f uh, probably feel that to, to, this, to the same extent, but my parents, and 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 uh, an older generation, they went through several crises that I have mentioned. They lost their jobs. They didn't have savings. Uh, families were broken because people were were living uh, to uh, to gain sources of income abroad, and the population basically lost their uh, let's say uh, their uh, predictability, the sense of predictability, because communist state and the uh, this. A uh, planned economy, uh, the uh, reliability on one party, and that that party was saying what is right, and you, you didn't have choice to actually choose between many truths. It's only only one truth. So all those uh, collapses which took place uh, were affecting the the um, uh, the confidence of the population, the confidence of the families, the, which were forming the the fabric of the society, and therefore we had this. Uh, looking for new models, uh, way to look at those models was quite difficult because the population was very russified. We had only one source or several sources of information which were coming from Russia, not other places. Yes, in case of Moldova, it's also, uh, Moldova is, uh, is luckier uh, than other countries from the post-Soviet space because we speak a, a European language. We speak the Romanian language. And that created opportunity for some segments of the society to, to find these sources of information, sources of inspiration um, on, the, on the right bank of Prut River, which is separating Moldova, uh, the geographical divide between Moldova and Romania. But other than, th than that, we, we are still uh, using the Russian sources of information uh, up until now. That is why we have so much distrust um, with regard to, to our democracies, which are not perfect, they are in transition, but still uh, we, can, uh, we can create this local, uh, local wisdom and local, um, local sources of information in order to provide um, a domestic perspective about the agency of the country, which is something that ha has missed for, uh, for a long time. So lacking all these elements which are part of uh, or parts of, of the society and of the statehood of, of, uh, of Moldova um, brings us to, this, to, the, to the stage when uh, we still have uh, a lot of opportunities uh, to, um, to, in a way, uh, 
uh, gain the lost time. And the European model of development, uh, the Western uh, rapprochement with the West, and the fact that more and more people are traveling to the EU, uh, even against the, the odds, uh, I mean, the pandemic, we still have a positive, uh, let's say, approach toward the freedom of movement. Um, and people are benefiting from visa liberalization. They, they try to, uh, to get jobs and get opportunities in the EU because Moldova is still not capable uh, to provide that to their citizens. But in general, the country is moving in the right direction. The problem is at home. The problem is in the political party, still in the political party system that, uh, that is struggling to, uh, to, uh, to constitute this, uh, this framework of, of fresh new institutions that are not politicized, that are run uh, based on merits, that have uh, resources to, uh, to uh, manage properly the public policies, and that are anchored into, uh, into Western practices and, and in general sense of, uh, uh, of moral and moral, um, moral identity, because I think that many times we speak about Western standards as something which is morally superior than autocracies. And we still, we still should speak about that, but also prove in, in actions, because I agree totally with Bakar mentioning that uh, in our region, not only Georgia, but also I think to some extent Ukraine and Moldova, of course, uh, are dealing with facade uh, democracies and uh, the transformations are coming very slow and to really manage to do that, we need to, to read and to understand what are, the, uh, what are the signals that are coming from the society. And I'm very glad that Olha uh, brought a lot, of, uh, a lot of flavor related to the public polls and, and how we need to read those public polls, because in case of the Moldova, they are less optimistic than in, in Ukraine. We have less, um, less interest for European integration, especially if it is compared to uh, Eurasian Union. Right now, it's about 50 to 50. European integration is more popular, but unfortunately, because of irresponsibility of the pro-EU or so-called pro-EU parties uh, between 2009 and 2019, uh, we we has lost a lot of a lot of uh, support and sympathies, sympathies for the European Union. So now, apart from modernizing the institutions, modernizing or uh, bringing uh, responsible politicians in the political party system, we also should uh, should take care and nurture, let's say, um, a right and correct and accurate uh, perspective about the European integration. This is not a paradise, but this is a model. A prosperous model for the societies that have nothing to compare with. I mean, they have only their very uh, distorted impressions about how the USSR functioned. Uh, but this, as I mentioned, were, uh, are distorted impressions. So we need now to really put a lot of effort in making the European integration uh, a sort of uh, roadmap for the development of our countries and Moldova particularly. We need to use this uh, in order to reintegrate Moldova, to try to reintegrate Moldova as much as possible because the Transnistrian region and the separatism in the Transnistrian region, as well as the, let's say, uh, some um, uh, discontent in the Gagawuzian region can be fixed and are fixable with the support of European integration. Uh, connecting the country with the uh, with the European uh, market, uh, with European values, can bring this kind of glue, uh, necessary glue, which was missing in order to exactly create this uh, bigger perspective for, for the country. And I'm finishing here uh, my idea. Um, I wanted to uh, to say in the in conclusion that I I uh, uh, rely a lot in my positive um, examination of the Moldovan case study on the diaspora. I think that diaspora and the, uh, the possibility to have a reverse uh, brain, um, uh, brain drain in order to bring back our brains, uh, it, it's, it's a crucial uh, essential element for all three countries, both uh, maybe for, for, for Georgia and Moldova because they are smaller countries we have a depopulation. Moldova lost about 30% of its population since, uh, since uh, 19. Uh, we, we need more the diaspora, but I think that Ukraine uh, will feel the same problem very soon. So 
we, we can bring diaspora and we can use uh, their knowledge, we can use their education and, and uh, actually make uh, as much uh, possible uh, use of, of them in order to not only consolidate the democracies, but also making the, let's say, the European integration not just a dream for the elites, but actually a reality for the, for the majority of the population. And here I will stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Denis, for that. Uh, for your for your insight and commentary, I think uh, a lot of common threads have been um, have been exposed during our discussion. Uh, of course, there are also some very strong variations, uh, in particularly the approaches to to democracy in the different countries that we're looking at uh, since the since the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, but of course, uh, some very common themes that I just wanted to point out in terms of uh, looking at issues like poverty, inequality. Um, this facade democracy, especially as we look at uh, Georgia and Moldova, um, huge divide between the top and the bottom, distrust of institutions and the elite seem to also be, be there. But also on the positive side, looking at mobilization of, of uh, society, mobilization of populations, mobilization of, uh, of civil society. Ukraine is, of course, the leading example, but we see it as Bakar even mentioned, and uh, and we have a, a comment from from Oliver uh, Reisner also about uh, the, the these uh, protests in Georgia against the hydro the hydro plant shows that there is still there is still some ability in the society to mobilize uh, against uh, some sort of injustice. I think uh, which which is a positive signal. Um, we have a lot of really good comments and questions, and I I'm just uh, wanted to just pick on a few maybe. Um, and and what I would like to do is just go around uh, the whole panel one more time, and, and this will kind of be our, our closing as well. So th there's a question about specifically uh, looking at minority groups in in Moldova and and Ukraine, uh, how they can be resolved uh, in terms of uh, using European values as an argument to 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 engage with minority groups. So I'm going to put that out there. Uh, as well as uh, this theme, which I think is coming out between uh, some of the discussions, uh, also Belarus is in there, uh, as an example of how unexpectedly mass mobilization of, of society can, can take place, uh, and, the, and the question of the future. So I want to put that, I think, to the, to the, to the panel. Uh, just briefly, of course, it's impossible to talk about the future briefly, uh, as there's so many different areas we can look at. But I, I, I think specifically maybe ask each of you to just reflect uh, two, mi two minutes each about, you know, are you optimistic? And I have a sense hearing all of your different perspectives on what maybe the answer is, but I want to hear, hear from you each. Uh, uh, optimistic in terms of uh, the future of the democratic developments in, in the region or, or in your countries uh, and what might be a signal that things are going to be going in the right direction. So uh, maybe Kate, we'll we'll just go in the same order that we that we went in. And if there's any of the comments that you saw uh, uh, that you want to specifically address, please do so well. But as well, but let's. Uh, I'll just ask you that we all try to keep them brief, and we'll wrap up. Uh, we'll wrap up shortly. Um, thank you, and and thank you to all my uh, fellow uh, presenters. I really learned a lot, and I, um, you know, just craving this knowledge from, you know, I'm sitting here in the woods in upstate New York, and it's so great to hear what, what is going on um, on the ground in, in these places. Um, and I guess we were talking before the panel started about sort of positionality of researchers and, you know, me being in, in the U.S. and, um, you know, writing this big synthetic thing about the former Soviet Union. And I think what I've realized listening to um, my colleagues and, and thinking about this project again is, you know, we're, we're all together in this question now of what is the future of democracy? You know, there, this idea that somehow America or Europe has some model. I mean, and yes, we do in some ways, right? We're lucky in some ways to have marginally more functional institutions and, and um, markets. Um, but even here, right? I mean, we've lived through this, you know, profoundly disorienting year here at four years. Um, and I at least feel very strongly this sort of existential question of, you know, 
will the liberal project, uh, not the neoliberal, the liberal project um, remain, you know, will, um, you know, we're, we're wondering if there is there going to be another coup here, right? You know, is it, it will we hold together? Um, and so I think this eroding this sense of you know we've made it and others have it and everybody just needs to catch up is less useful than ever. But what is more useful is all of us together. You know, um, I mean, I was so happy to hear Dennis and and Olya's um, you know sort of optimism and uh, you know realistic optimism. Let's put it that way because I think that's that's what we need now. And, and, you know, Bakar's, you know, cry to, to bring back the idea of the common good. I mean, that's what we're hearing here too, right? That this, um, so I just, I, I just feel, I feel positive in the sense that we're all in that project together now. And that maybe that's a better way to think about this going forward is not what can you learn from us or how can we help you get here, but that we are all now um, in this struggle to keep what's worthwhile about these types of societies um, going. Thank you. It's a good, maybe a good place to be. Yeah, everyone yeah, together. Exactly, <laughs> we, we, absolutely. We, yeah, we just have to recognize that. Yeah, thanks. Olga. Right, yeah, I think what all of us struggled to summarize 30 years in a short period of time and now the future in one minute or less. Uh, I, I am also, I, I think, I am not necessarily an optimist per se, but I, I think I'm possibly more optimistic than some people. Um, most notably because I found that the populations of these different places have always surprised us. Um, and I think in some instances quite pleasantly, and we should, we should not um, underestimate that when it is quite incredible and powerful. Um, uh, and I, of course, I think the conversation needs to be about social democracy, not so much one version of democracy and, and clearly, you know, the, the elements that we're talking about in Ukraine. The, when people forget that although the median poverty rate is getting better, that many people live in a state of poverty and they do not and politicians do not acknowledge that in their campaigns, but rather lean to identity type politics like in the 2019 elections. In 2019, I don't think Zelensky is a terrible, <laughs> uh, you, uh, you've read some of my other thoughts, I don't think it's a terrible outcome actually, but I do think that another much more sinister, illiberal um, actor could appear and fill that void if this is not addressed, if poverty is not an inequality, is not a major concern of politicians. And on the issue, I, I don't really want to comment on the issue of the particular minority groups in Ukraine, uh, but I'll only say this, myself being a, a part of an ethnic minority group in Poland, right? Um, my parents being involved in Polish politics and in, 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 in state politics and diplomacy, uh, I, I know the complexity of growing up as an ethno-linguistic minority in a country. And uh, the biggest problems, I think, are when uh, countries, whether it be Poland or Ukraine, do not acknowledge that these things are a problem and do not acknowledge the perceptions of the minority groups. This isn't uh, black, white, right, wrong, but these perceptions of minority groups matter, their lived experiences matter, and they must be taken seriously. Thank you so much, Olga. Uh, Bakar. Okay, I mean, uh, we Georgians are always hoping for the best, even we don't have any reason to do that. So, uh, so uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, to be serious, I mean, uh, uh, no. for example, when, when when I mentioned, and everybody knows in Georgia, this protest against uh, this unfair energy policy, concretely it's against the hydro, hydropower plant, this actually makes a uh, quite good optimism because it is, uh, in my own observation, it is a, real popular protest which Georgia experienced from the, the its transition, pro-Soviet transition. It's a real popular protest. It's a real conflict between the private interest and the public interests. It's a real conflict between the needs of society and the, and the, uh, I don't know, uh, and the hegemony of neoliberal capital. And I see that in this protest, the ordinary citizens are mobilizing 
they are mobilizing uh, very well and they are mobilizing uh, in, in, a, in a certain values, in a certain way they, they know what they do, they know what they say. And this really makes an optimistic future for the Georgia. I mean, the ordinary citizens who are, who are already uh, consolidated against a concrete, uh, against a concrete challenge. Uh, and the challenge is again the neoliberal greedness, which tries to take our own collective resources. Thanks, Bakar. I guess, uh, as Olga said, let's, we should not underestimate uh, the power of uh, uh, some things of happening. Yeah, exactly. Dennis, uh, you get uh, our your final say, the final say for for our discussion. For Moldova, there is no other option than to uh, than, than to implement reforms and modernize, uh, because uh, the negative scenario would be to uh, to basically bail uh, uh, to look for help from other places and even to lose the statehood. I really believe that if Moldova failed to deliver to their citizens services and and goods, then Moldovans will look for quick solutions. Uh, and one of them is to reunite with Romania. I know, I know that now it, uh, it looks like quite extreme, but I'm saying that the, uh, the Moldovan politicians have a window of maybe 10 to 15 to 20 years to really uh, try to solve people's issues, not their, not their desires, political desires and caprices. Because otherwise, as the polls show, uh, the population, uh, regardless of their identity, uh, maybe uh, egocentrism, will look for uh, for a quick uh, solution. And Romania is nearby. Romania is already in the EU. It's part of uh, of uh, NATO and in general Western world. And the problem is that this will come with uh, with uh, problems because we have transition region, we have Russian factor, we have Gagauzian autonomy inside Moldova. So in order to avoid future uh, future uh, crises related to uh, security, uh, we need to really fix Moldova as quick as possible. Of course, using democracy and using all those uh, all, all those ingredients that I have talked about uh, during my presentation. Thank you so much, Dennis. Uh, I think we are well over our time, but I think it was worth it. Uh, these are definitely issues that we're going to continue to talk about throughout this year. And I do want uh, to thank uh, not just the partners who helped organize this event, uh, our speakers for being here with us, and also for, our, uh, uh, for you who are out there watching us. Thank you all for joining us. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Stay tuned. I'm sure we will continue this uh, throughout the many months and years to come. Uh, and hopefully 30 years from now, we will be looking at it uh, in a completely different light. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and we can look back at this discussion as, as the, the start of, of the, the road to the positive, <laughs> the positive path. So thank you all again uh, and, uh, and goodbye and have a great rest, rest of the week.